All right. So we are in Acts 14 today, starting in verse 5. It says, And when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, the apostles learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued proclaiming the good news. In Lystra, there was a man sitting who couldn't use his feet and had never walked, for he had been crippled from birth. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, and Paul looked at him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And the man sprang up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We are mortals, just like you, and we bring you good news, that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to follow their own ways. Yet, he has not left himself without a witness in doing good, giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, and filling you with food and your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium and won over the crowds. Then they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the city. The next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. After they had proclaimed the good news to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, then on to Iconium and Antioch. There they strengthened the souls of the disciples and encouraged them to continue in the faith, saying, It's through many persecutions that we enter the kingdom of God. Let's dream together that we live in the first century, near the center of what is now the country of Turkey. Maybe we're masons, or builders, or soldiers, or we make, we make and sell bread, or wine, or spices, candles, shoes, tents, pots and pans, oil lamps, or cloth. We can't really read very well, most of us. Some of us know maybe some Greek slaves who can, who show up every day or two to buy food at the market where we work. We eat mostly grains or porridge. Every morning, every morning we wake up, and the male head of our houses, the pater familias, leads each of our families in offering quiet prayers and performing rituals in front of a small shrine in our homes, what amounts to a miniature temple in our houses, our family lorariums. Now, this is just one of many parts of our lives that are dedicated to making sure that the gods help us and the people around us, to be protected and successful and happy, that we get what we want and avoid harm. Occasionally, during festival days or other celebrations that punctuate our lives, we join the crowds at the, at the temple of Zeus or Apollos or Artemis. The priests of each temple perform their prayers and ritually slaughter an ox or a cow or some chickens or lamb, and then they roast the animal over a fire. And then aside from the parts that, of the animals that are offered to the god or used to make a reading, of what the future may hold, 
We all enjoy the remaining, the remaining meat together in a feast. Now, unless we're into shipping or trade, we don't tend to travel very far or even go out at night because, of course, there are no street lights and there are no police. If we're attacked or robbed, we must band together with a few others and pursue the perpetrator ourselves. But in general, our lives are orderly and somewhat predictable. And in a way, our small lives are connected with the rest of the empire via the Roman roads and the Mediterranean Sea. But more than the roads, what binds every aspect of our lives together and the lives of those around us is the Greco-Roman cult. Now pause the dream for a second. In our modern world, we call this part of human life religion. And we also, in modern times, tend to think of religion as a, a set of beliefs, primarily, and maybe some additional particular rituals or practices that are, are connected to those beliefs. And that whole set of things together forms one sort of added-on compartment or piece of our lives. But for the people living in, a, in the ancient Roman Empire, there was no religion as something tacked onto the rest of life. There was just life. Their understanding of what we might call religion, their practices and beliefs related to spiritual forces and powers and deities all around them, those things absolutely permeated, saturated their lives. Every waking moment was caught up in this all-encompassing fabric of the Greco-Roman cult. This was, as philosopher Charles Taylor puts it, an enchanted world. Everything from the entertainment in the Colosseums, like the gladiators fighting each other, the torture and execution of state prisoners, to the market salespeople selling their wares, to the Olympic athletes competing against each other, all of it is caught up in a single web. In fact, the reason why conflict between various groups paused during the Isthmian and Olympic Games back then was not because they prioritized sports more than anything else, unlike us, <laughs> uh, but because they prioritized the gods more than anything else. The entire affair was one big tribute to the gods. But when we say that the cult permeates our lives, we're back in the dream now. When we say that the cult permeates our lives, it's not so much that we're always walking around saying prayers or reciting our beliefs about the gods, but that everything we do has its meaning, its very being, within a web of forces that are always at work and which we need to do our best to get on the good side of. One of the defining phrases, do ut des, I give so that you may give. They're talking about the relationship with the gods. We must provide our end of the bargain as a means of completing a transaction with the range of deities and powers and forces that infuse the cosmos. We do our part, they do their part in return. And there are deities for every aspect of our lives that we need to be sure to appease and which might therefore help us out. There's a spirit for when crops are planted. There's another for when they're harvested. And there's another for when they're stored. There are deities for every kind of task and facet of human life, individually and collectively. Every time we have a noticeable or memorable dream, every time something striking or odd or arresting happens, we must pause and discern its meaning as a part of this larger web of forces at work around us. Every time a momentous occasion or journey approaches, we need to consult the oracles, offer sacrifice, beg wisdom and favor from the gods. This is our life. This was our great-grandparents' life, and this will be the life of our great-grandchildren. 
This is not only the background or stage for our every thought. It is all we can imagine. It's just the way things are. And now, there's a commotion out in the square. Two Jewish men have come telling some strange story about another Jewish man who was crucified and then raised from the dead. Can you believe it? And what's more, at their word, a lame man that we've all seen begging in the streets from time to time seems to be standing up and walking around. We're stunned. And all we can do is shout that the gods have come down in human form. Our reaction, of course, is to make sense of what we've seen in terms of what we know. And what we know is Zeus, the chief god, and Hermes, his messenger, his speaker. Clearly, the powers that be have turned in our favor. Now, not too surprisingly, these two are resisting being publicly recognized as Zeus and Hermes. They, they seem to be wanting to maintain the ruse of showing up under these human forms. But we all know the truth, don't we? And so does the priest. And we all know what to do. Get the oxes. Get the garlands. This is an august, uh, an august occasion. These two great ones have come to visit our little town. We must offer the appropriately august sacrifice to make sure they're pleased now that they've met us. With any luck, they'll continue to shower these kinds of gifts upon all of us. But then, strangely, these two guys absolutely refuse the worship and tribute we are offering to them. They say they're just mortals. But more than that, they're saying not just that we have misunderstood who and what they are, they're saying that we've misunderstood ourselves and the world around us in the deepest possible way. They're telling us to reconceive our entire lives Indeed, the entire cosmos in a radically different way. They're not just telling us to add one more God to the array that already permeate and overshadow our lives. They're telling us instead to turn our minds, our spirits, ourselves in a new direction. To acknowledge one single creator and sustainer of all things. The real source of life and goodness and joy. A God of love who wants love. They're saying that there is just one in whom we live and move and have our being. Okay, let's wake from our dream. We're back in the 21st century. And in several important ways, it's different. It's difficult to pluck this story out of the, the Greco-Roman setting and set it back down neatly into our own context. It's difficult to draw from this story, from Paul's attitude and message, the same kinds of implications that Paul and Barnabas's first century hearers might have drawn from them. So how is this story still our story? What in the world does this story have to do with us? Well, I think answering that begins with asking ourselves what exactly is happening in this story. What is at the heart of it? What we see in this story from Acts is an all-encompassing network of web or web of forces and voices and powers and people. A world defined by worship and transactions with the powers that be. And we see people in that context making sense of everything they encounter within that framework, right? Every, even foreign and new messages are recast and twisted into something else to make sense of them in their own context. So the gospel message that Paul is delivering, a message founded in the love of the one transcendent, immortal creator and sustainer of all things, that message is at least initially translated, converted, reduced by the people receiving it into a story about Zeus and Hermes. And so Paul and Barnabas are themselves identified as immortal, sources of divine favor, and worthy of sacrifice themselves. Of course, for Paul and Barnabas, it's obvious, and they are adamant, that
that we should never ascribe that kind of worth or title to a mere creature. But these citizens of Lycaonia are perceiving what's happening in front of them in the framework that makes sense to them. The framework that has defined every moment, every facet of their lives up to this point. Now, making sense of things by starting from within our own language and context is not itself a bad thing. We all do this. We did it a moment ago when we read this story in English. Right? Each culture needs to do this to some extent. What Paul and Barnabas are rejecting, though, is the twisting of the story of the gospel and their part in it into a totally different story, a totally different message, where the core of the message is lost or missed or replaced with something else entirely. And that is something we must be concerned with in each era and place. So think for a second about what Paul and Barnabas are asking of their hearers. They're not simply saying that their hearers should change one of the things that they believe or add a new belief. They're asking them to reboot their minds entirely, to rethink everything, to let the way that they think be tr completely transformed. This is not a minor adjustment. This is a revolution that goes down to their bones. In each era, that is what is asked of this story's readers, of Scripture's readers. The readers of this story are asked to step back from their world, from their context, again and again, from the cacophony of voices and objects flooding our lives, voices so loud and objects so common that they rouse no suspicion or questions from us. These voices, often the loudest and most constant voices of our lives and culture, these things become the unnoticed background noise of our lives, reshaping, recasting everything into their image, drawing our hearts towards lifeless things and lifeless ways of being. In the same way, these first century hearers' initial instinct was to cast and frame and perceive what they saw and heard purely within the framework, the culture, network of meaning that had permeated their lives up to this point. We tend to look back at these pagan hearers and sort of scoff, how ridiculous, at their failure to understand what they saw, thinking that we aren't inclined to do the same thing. But in each era, we are prone to resisting the scandalous gospel message at the heart of which is a loving creator who offers himself in death and who calls his followers to die alongside him. A gospel message that says we need to rethink what truly good news really amounts to. A message that says being fully alive, being fully and wholly human, involves not standing on the backs of others, not gloating in victory over our enemies, but loving them turning our cheeks and offering our cloaks. This message we tend to soften, to rationalize away, to reject or twist into something else. We don't want to be drafted and transformed by this message and this Messiah. We want to draft and transform this message and this Messiah to our cause. And so, so it turns out we actually have a lot in common with the Lycaonians. And so through this story, in each era, the Spirit moves us to ask again and again, what powers or voice forces or voices or people or parties or things are at work together shaping and defining our lives and priorities? What things or people or parties have gained more blind trust from us than they deserve? How are all of these parts of our lives twisting and reshaping, directing every other part of our life toward themselves, or recasting every other part of our life into their image? What picture have the people and parties and things of my life, what picture have these things together painted for me of what it means to be human, what it means to succeed, or how to think about my neighbor, my enemy, and what sorts of things to bend my life towards? I think if we're honest, the picture all these things paint 
of the sort of lives that we should lead, the sorts of things we should love and value and seek, is very similar to that of Paul's first hearers. And this is why his message of making a radical shift in the way that we think about ourselves and the world around us, his message of turning away from empty things, worthless things, and towards something truly worthy of our trust, resonates through history down to our present culture, which is as full of deceptive things and messages as the Roman Empire was in the middle of the first century. So although this story seems distant, the message at its core is one we all need to hear again and again. The message is, snap out of it. To turn to all these empty things for rest, peace, and wholeness ends up draining rest and peace and wholeness from us. To paraphrase Augustine, your hearts will not find rest until they rest in something that can't fail or be corrupted, something truly worthy of that kind of trust. Our hearts will be restless until they rest in the one in whose heart they were designed to rest, the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who has given us rains from heaven and fruitful seasons and filled us with food and our hearts with joy. Let's pray together. God, we praise your holy name. We pray that you would transform us, melt us down, recast us in your image. Please give us minds to know you, hearts to seek you, wisdom to find you, and hope of finally embracing you. Through Christ we pray. Amen.